Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all for uh, for coming out and uh, spending your uh, part of your afternoon with us. Um, my name is Eric Goods. I'm the current chair of the executive board for Students for Sensible Drug Policy here at UC Davis. And uh, uh, before I get started, I just wanted to just kind of say a few things. First of all, uh, thank you very much for our friendly ASUCD Senator uh, Roman Rabillas, who's sitting in the back there, who helped us out with uh, with this uh, this lovely space here for today. So thank you very much. Um, and then secondly, I uh, just wanted to give a, a short brief description about Students for Sensible Drug Policy here, for those of you that may or may not be uh, familiar with the organization on campus. Um, we're starting our second year here actually on campus, um, as of just a few days ago, so that's uh, very exciting. But basically what we're all about is uh, we are an organization um, of, made up of over 200 distinct uh, student chapters uh, that essentially comprise mostly in the United States, but also um, in other parts of the world as well. And our main focus is on um, essentially uh, education and reform of our current drug policies and sort of the understanding and recognition that the current war on drugs that's been plaguing our country and other places around the world has failed and that we're more interested in uh, sensible, more sensible, more just, and more harm reduction strategy focused policy reform going into the future. So uh, some of the work that we've been doing on campus in addition to hosting some of these uh, educational events uh, that we love to do as well. Uh, we're also working on a lot of policy initiatives on campus, uh, such as a Good Samaritan policy campaign that helps to ensure uh, that students and those within the campus community have certain protections that are already available under law, and those are made available here on campus for everybody's safety. Uh, again, uh, concerned with our uh, looking at harm reduction strategies for students. So that's a little bit about us. Um, we have uh, Catherine at the door who's got our, our, our sign-up sheet, uh, and that's for our email that we have go out that Get you in a loop for all sorts of different events, activities, and things we have going on. We've got a very busy uh, next few weeks, uh, and we've also had a very busy year next year. Um, so just a couple things we've got going on. We have a, a lecture series that's actually coming up at the end of May, which is going to be a lecture series on uh, the science of psychedelics in general. Uh, so you'll hear a little bit about that today, uh, but this is going to be sort of a lecture series slash symposium, uh, bringing in a lot of different folks from outside organizations uh, across the Bay and in the Sacramento region that are going to be talking about uh, psychedelic science. Uh, so that should be a very interesting talk as well. That, again, will be uh, the end of May, May 28th. Um, so uh, yeah, without uh, further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce our guest speaker for today, uh, Dr. Jonathan Keshe. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's a postdoctoral scholar here at uh, UC Davis, uh, working in the field of neuroscience informatics. And he's very interested in learning about how uh, neuroscience and some of the cognitive theory that's behind there and how that intersects with uh, some of the growing data needs and the informatics that's been happening uh, in, in the revival that's been uh, sort of coming about uh, with technology the last uh, several years. So we're very excited to have him here to, to talk to us a little bit about how drugs in, interact with the brain in particular. And uh, without further ado, Dr. Jonathan Pichet. Thanks, Eric. And uh, thanks for coming out, guys. Um, I'm, I'm happy to do this for the Students for Sensible Drug Policy. I think it's a great organization. And what I'm hoping to do this afternoon is just sort of provide a broad overview of some drugs and their interactions in the brain, and then contrast that to um, what is sensible and reasonable in regards to uh, regulation and policy. Um, so I'm going to go over some principles of psychopharmacology. We'll get into some drugs and neurotransmitters. Um, then using these psychoactive compounds as tools to understand the brain. And then, like I said, we'll go over some social and political policy stuff. Um, I, before we go, though, I wanted to play a little game that I uh, can try called death or addiction. Um, this is a graph that has the um, lethal dose, so like how much you can take effectively before it becomes toxic or lethal. And over here is a scale from being really safe to a high addiction potential. So I wanted to, I put caffeine and nicotine in there, and I wanted to sort of pick one of these and see if you guys uh, could guess where it would go or, or think of where you think it would go. Um, so if we did alcohol, for example, do you think it would be over here, over here? Any ideas on where that would be? Probably be off to the right of caffeine. 
Okay. I was hoping that we could write on the whiteboard and actually put these on there, but we're not going to be able to do that. What about uh, LSD? Bottom. Bottom? Okay. Good. So I think that we're, we're starting on, a, on the same page here on the realities of, of this stuff. So to get into a little bit of psychopharmacology, I wanted to share three major principles. They're sort of central tenets to psychopharmacology. Um, pharmacokinetics is the understanding of how the body affects the drug. So this includes like the method of administration, how it's absorbed, how it's distributed throughout the body, metabolism, and then eventually excreted. This pharmacodynamics is how the drug affects the body. So this is how it binds to receptors, uh, dose response curves based on concentrations in the synap uh, synapse between neurons. And then lastly, an interesting one, uh, set and setting. This is sort of a, a huge concept in psychopharmacology in that the user's mindset prior to consuming a drug has a big effect on how that drug actually affects them. Perhaps even more so than the mechanisms of the drug itself. Um, coupled with the setting, including the physical environment, so out in the woods or uh, you know, trapped in the CIA's basement, um, as well as the social and cultural environment that surrounds drug use and the attitudes and values towards them. Um, I, I included two pretty cool examples here. Um, Timothy Leary did a study. DMT was first considered to be this just terror-inducing hallucinogenic. Uh, every time you took it, you, you freaked out. He thought that set and setting uh, would change that. So he put strict controls on set and setting. He um, set everybody up, and they had what was reportedly a pleasant experience uh, after that. Also, um, there's tales of, uh, not tales, I mean, there's studies, but heroin addicts, for example, let's say you're a heroin addict and you have your favorite gas station. You score your drugs, you go to the gas station, you shoot up in the bathroom. You do that repeatedly, over and over. Eventually, you develop a tolerance. Let's say you've got three or four times more um, milligrams than what you a normal person could have. Um, if this uh, heroin user then injects that large amount of drugs in a, in a different environment, let's say a McDonald's, uh, there's a pretty strong potential that they could overdose and die. Um, because their body hasn't prepared and it isn't used to, it, it, when you go into the gas station bathroom, the body sort of anticipates and starts defending against the um, introduction of this exogenous drug. You remove that setting, you can then overdose and die. So it's pretty powerful. The set and setting concept is, is pretty powerful. Um, I'm assuming that we're familiar with the synapse. This is uh, a neuron. We call this the presynaptic cell. This is the synapse, and this is the postsynaptic <clears throat> cell. What is just illustrated here is that uh, neurotransmitters are made from a precursor with enzymes. They're packed into things called vesicles and then shuttled to the end of the neuron where they're released in the synapse to be received by receptors. Um, there's a number of ways that drugs can affect this process. Um, I don't want to go through them all. There's a lot of them. But for example, a drug serves as a neurotransmitter precursor. Uh, a good example of this is in the treatment of Parkinson's, they pr uh, provide L-DOPA. L-DOPA is a precursor to dopamine. Parkinson's is a deficiency of dopamine in um, the uh, striatal pathway. And so by providing L-DOPA, you can improve or enhance the activity of dopamine. Uh, another good example is a drug that blocks the autoreceptors. So these are, uh, once the neurotransmitters are released, they can get pulled back into the presynaptic neuron out of the synapse, making them not effective, not affecting the postsynaptic neuron. Um, if you block that, more neurotransmitter stays inside the synapse. Uh, a classic example is fluoxetine or any other selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. These increase the amount of serotonin in the synapse, um, effectively elevating mood is the theory. So we'll move on. I wanted to just throw up acetylcholine and, and give uh, a, a broad overview real quick. We don't want to get into too much uh, detail here. Distribution, um, acetylcholine is, is made in the ponds here in the midbrain and then released sort of all over the nervous system. It is involved in movement as well as um, cognitive functioning and memory. Um, it is hugely involved at the neuromuscular junction. Anytime a muscle contracts, uh, including not just the muscles on you know, your arms, your legs, but your heart, your lungs, all of these things are controlled by a uh, balance between acetylcholine and norepinephrine. 
um, as well as arousal and CNS. So these are critical life functions. Um, as evidenced by, so sarin gas um, is a acetylcholine uh, antagonist. What it does is it irreversibly binds the enzyme that degrades acetylcholine. If acetylcholine isn't being degraded, you have excess amounts of acetylcholine, and at this point, your muscles are going into spasm, and you're essentially just going to, your lungs and your heart are going to stop. You're just going to die. And it's irreversible. That's why it's nasty, nasty stuff. Um, nicotine, uh, interestingly enough, binds to the nicotinic receptor of acetylcholine, um, named because this molecule has a super high affinity for that receptor. Um, it enhances neurotransmitter release, eventually resulting in dopamine being released in the nucleus accumbens. We'll get to that, but that's a uh, reward pathway, a pleasurable pathway. Um, with nicotine, uh, if you have too much, nicotine toxicity can lead to death. Because of acetylcholine's involvement in these critical life functions. Uh, moving on to dopamine, everybody knows about dopamine. Dopamine has... Uh, Three or four pathways, these are the two major ones. The mesolimbic pathway goes from the ventral tegmental area to the uh, amygdala and nucleus accumbens. This is involved in pleasure, motivation, reward, essentially addiction for what people think it is. I have it in quotes because during a drug talk, I want to be careful about throwing around the word addiction. Um, this pathway is old as can be. I mean, you have to be rewarded for eating well for having sex, um, for social interactions. All of these things have to be, to motivate behavior, the mesolimbic pathway is involved in that. Uh, like I was mentioning earlier, the uh, striatum pathway is involved in coordinated movement. So when in the substantia nigra, when the dopaminergic cells, the cells that produce dopamine start dying off, there's a lack of dopamine. It's unable to coordinate movement or plan movement. And that's why you see the, uh, the movement abnormalities in something like Parkinson's. Again, these are all sort of critical, low-level low functions that are uh, very important to, to sustaining life. The number of receptors, D1 through 5, they're spread all throughout the nervous system and the central nervous system. And there's a number of cool drugs that affect dopamine. In fact, almost all drugs affect dopamine at some point. Uh, might not be directly, but they're going to get there. Um, Amphetamines increase dopamine release. Opiates uh, increase dopamine release right into that pleasure center, the nucleus accumbens. Cocaine increases dopamine in the synapse by blocking the reuptake, much like fluoxetine. And then caffeine, uh, though through the um, uh, adrenergic system, ultimately res results in an increase in dopamine and glutamine. Um, and so, you know, we have. Amphetamines, opiates, cocaine, caffeine. Um, I'm going to pick on caffeine for a little bit. Um, caffeine is probably by far the most used behavioral active substance in the world. I've heard statistics like right now, about at least 70% of humans on Earth have caffeine in their system. Um, but during my graduate work, which I'll sort of show you a little bit later, um, I gave a, a lot of drugs to fish and watched how they behave. And caffeine was by far the worst that I had ever seen, primarily because um, of this dose response curve. So what this shows is that the amount of caffeine in one cup of coffee gets you to about here, meaning that the adrenergic receptors are what's activated. If you increase the amount of caffeine very quickly, you start blocking GABA, um, you start inducing the cytotoxicity, all sorts of critical cell functions become inhibited. So when I gave caffeine to the fish, we had to do a dose response curve. You start out with a little, you add a little bit more, you add a little bit more. As soon as we got to a certain point, the fish just seized and died. I mean, instantly. It was, um, you know, it wasn't expected, but it was, it was something I'll never forget. Um, so, yeah. So, so if I were to go just down 10 cups of coffee right now, I would die. I wouldn't do that. I, wouldn't I mean, I'm not saying I want. Yeah, um, it's more like I, three or four grams. Yeah, yeah. Forty cups. I think it's a, I think it's a few grams. But you wouldn't feel good. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's the, I would be more worried if you were like scooping powdered caffeine into a cup and trying to chug it or something like that. 
So for some, for some drug that's so celebrated in our culture, you can get it every corner. Um, you know, it's actually a pretty dangerous drug if you push it to the limits. Um, and the range between the effective dose and the lethal dose is pretty small, meaning that like you're teetering a very thin line between I'm just, you know, waking up and feeling good to now I'm having serious problems and I could potentially like have to go to the hospital. Serotonin. Um, serotonin distribution is all around town comes up from below, all sort of, uh, the, the primary serotonergic uh, uh, cell clusters are in the brainstem. Um, and interestingly enough, 70% of the serotonin in your body is in your stomach. Um, and, you know, it just hurts, it reminds me of uh, Galen, a Greek scientist or doctor, if you want to say, he described uh, a gut feeling. I think we're all sort of familiar with the idea of a gut feeling. Um, with 70% of the serotonin in the stomach, it's pretty interesting as like thinking about the stomach as sort of a second brain. Yep. Is there actual links? Has it been shown to be because dopamine doesn't necessarily modulate pleasure, it can modulate movement mm -hmm. or control movement. Mm -hmm. So serotonin being produced in the stomach doesn't necessarily mean we've got lots of feelings in our stomach. No, so no, I was no, curious no. if there, there's a lot of dietary books to make that connection too. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if there's an association between that serotonin and being transmitted to the brain. Or transmitted yeah. To the brain. So the brain synthesizes its own serotonin. Um, I'm not familiar with any sort of studies that show that serotonin migrates from the stomach to the brain. Um, but if I had to, to make a hypothesis, uh, I think that the overall concentration of serotonin in your sort of body and your head are sort of in balance. And if there's an imbalance there, there could Um, regulation of mood, emotionality, sensory perception. I mean, there's really uh, not a lot of things that don't involve serotonin. However, they're all sort of higher level uh, functions. It's not, um, I need to make this heartbeat. I need to breathe in this air. I need to find food to survive. It's sort of, I, I, you know, I want to promote my own wellness. I want to be happy. I want to be sociable. So it's sort of higher order level things. Um, this will become important when we, when we relate back to the graph I showed where, um, what was your name? Walter. Walter. Walter accurately said LSD is down here in the safe, non-lethal, non-addictive um, part of the graph. Primarily because it affects serotonin so much and these aren't critical life functions uh, that are being modulated by serotonin. Um, to make matters even more complicated, serotonin has a number of receptors with a number of subclass receptors, um, and they have differing effects. So like serotonin receptor one uh, could be uh, promote the release of dopamine, for example, whereas serotonin receptor two could result in uh, inhibiting the release of dopamine. Um, the effects are all over the board, and the interactions between them uh, and the systems that they regulate gets really complicated really quickly. Uh, when we're talking about serotonin, it only makes sense to go into the hallucinogenic drugs. Um, the point that I want to make here is that if you see the serotonin molecule, uh, psilocybin, the active compound, or the precursor to the active compound in magic mushrooms, you can see the same sort of motif here, uh, as well as with DMT and LSD as well. What's interesting to me very interesting to me is that an active dose approximately for psilocybin is about a quarter of a gram. Uh, if you ingest a quarter of a gram of mushrooms, you're going to go on a ride for about eight hours. Um, with DMT, typically smoked, you need about 20, maybe 50 milligrams smoked to have some sort of noticeable, discernible effect. That'll last for maybe five to 10 minutes. Uh, LSD is really unique. Um, Probably the most unique drug that I've come across, it's, it's really been fascinating to me, in that you only need about 50 to 150 micrograms uh, to have an effective dose. I mean, this is, this is nothing. You can't even see that. Uh, in micrograms for the psilocybin, it would be 250,000 micrograms. For the DMT, it would be 50,000 micrograms. So by ingesting this molecule at an amount that you can't even see, 
you're going to be going on a ride for maybe 10, 12 hours. You're not going to be you know, feeling normal. It'll probably wear off about 12 hours later. Um, that's, that's phenomenal to me. I mean, it's almost like magic. Um, so, so what does that mean? What, 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 what will we do with that? What can we do with these type of drugs? Uh, lastly, the cannabinoids. Um, cannabinoids, both the endocannabinoids and the phytocannabinoids, are retrograde intercellular messengers. Uh, essentially, my way to describe that is chill, bro. Just relax. Um, if a neuron is firing out glutamate to, to its uh, postsynaptic neuron, that, that constant firing will induce the production of cannabinoids, and then those cannabinoids will leave the postsynaptic cell go into the presynaptic cell and tell it to stop firing. So just chill out, um, settle down. There's two primary receptors uh, that we know about in the cannabinoids, although we know that there are more out there because of the uh, binding studies that we've done. We just don't know what they look like or how they work. Uh, interestingly, CB1 is primarily expressed in the central nervous system. It reduces GABA release and a number of other effects um, CB2 is in the immune system as well as stem cells and microglia within the brain. These are the brain's uh, defense mechanisms, the immune system of the brain. has a role in pain reduction as well as just maintaining general homeostasis. I think it has roles in maintaining bone mass. Um, the, the, the functions of the cannabinoids and the endocannabinoid system are constantly are, are an active area of inquiry. Um, Unfortunately, science has sort of been withheld from, from studying these things. Um, endocannabinoids, 2-AG, anandamide, there's more. Interestingly enough, anandamide is called the bliss molecule. Uh, it's naturally occurring in dark chocolate. Um, so if you get a sort of pleasurable effect from eating dark chocolate, it might be the anandamide hitting one of the CB1 or CB2 receptors. Um, and then there's the phytocannabinoids. So these are the cannabinoids uh, made by light in the marijuana plant, the cannabis plant. You know, ranges are all over the board. There's 85, there's 100, there's 60. Um, I chose to put approximately 85 active cannabinoid compounds that we can get from cannabis. Um, the most popular, of course, is THC. This would be the psychoactive compound, primarily hitting the CB1 receptor. Then uh, CBD. CBD has been all over the news recently with epilepsy and treating children with epilepsy. Um, CBD has an interesting profile in that it is, has a low affinity. It does not bind to CB1 or CB2. What it does is sort of float around those receptors as well as glutamate receptors. So this is the primary excitatory neuron or, or um, neurotransmitter in the, in the brain. Too much glutamate too much excitation, seizures. Um, dopamine and norepinephrine will fight over getting to the glutamate receptor. CBD sort of comes in and just stabilizes this sort of wobbling system to sort of uh, reduce the amount of excitation that's happening. Uh, CBN is primarily a CB2 uh, receptor agonist and it uh, is known to modulate the immune system. And so, with two primary distributions of the receptors, in the brain having a neuroprotective role and uh, defending the brain, as well as a role in the immune, uh, immune system throughout the body, um, the cannabinoids are very much a higher order uh, drug and system. They are not involved, like just like the serotonin uh, in critical life functions, it's becoming more and more clear that having a functional cannabinoid system in balance is essential for uh, proper health, um, protection, and growth um, throughout life. So how can we use these quote unquote drugs of abuse as research tools? I put that in quotes because uh, I've had to for the you know three years, three and a half years that I was in graduate school write grant applications to the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And I had to explain, or we had to spin a narrative that essentially said, we want LSD so we can understand drug addiction. Um, and it, it, it really irked me, because deep down inside, I wanted to get LSD because I thought it would be a very good tool to understand how the brain works and the sort of next frontier of what we can learn about the brain. Um, 
So putting that aside, um, from the molecular interactions that happen at the cellular level to subjective experience reports from human beings, we know what these drugs do. And we know that there's a number of drug categories, I highlighted several of them, that contain diverse compounds with overlapping effects. Um, because of this, we're then able to give the drugs, know what they're hitting, and then understand the behavior uh, and apply that in, in interesting ways. So uh, I'm going to show you the zebrafish party. These are zebrafish on some drugs. Um, what you're looking at right here, this is the zebrafish fish tank. You can imagine it's, it's a little bit, you know, it goes about this wide. Um, and then coming out over this axis is time, over six minutes. So a normal fish will get dropped in the tank and go down to the bottom and just sort of chill there. This would be the fish freezing for a while. Once it sort of gets acclimated a little bit more comfortable, it'll start swimming along the bottom and eventually start making loops to the upper half. Um, the idea is that it's safer at the bottom, there's no predators there, maybe birds. It's a pretty robust phenotype. Um, now if we add a long pheromone to the water in the tank, this is a molecule that's released from the epithelial cells of fish when they're bitten. Um, so it alerts all the other fish, you guys better get out of here because someone just ate a fish, ate one of us. Um, the fish goes in, freezes the whole time, stays at the bottom. This is a classic like high anxiety, stressed out phenotype of uh, zebrafish behavior. Caffeine uh, also has this type of phenotype. So too much caffeine, I'm down at the bottom, I'm freaked out, uh, freeze, uh, freeze. Um, not very organized, not very happy fish. <laughs> Um, so now we're looking at more anxiolytic or reduction of stress profiles. Uh, again, we have our control up there. An acute amount of nicotine, the fish will go in and just swim along the top all day long. Just does it immediately. Um, give it a little bit of booze for a while. He's loving it. He's swimming all over the place. Not worried about the, you know, the things at the top. And then... Um, Treatment with fluoxetine, so this is the uh, SSRI. Again, happy fish, kind of doing some weird movements, picking one side. Um, but, I, but I hope what, you, what you're getting out of this is that they're pretty different, they're pretty distinct based on what the drug is. And, and mind you that I, I, we have done these tests like over and over. So like I probably gave uh, 500 fish this acute nicotine treatment and we see the same general patterns over and over again. Did you have a question, Steve? Okay. So then we started giving them the hallucinogens and things started getting pretty weird. Um, so with LSD, they sort of swim, you know, up and to the side, spend a lot of time at the top, sort of large sweeping loops towards the end. MDMA looks like they're at a rave. I mean, it's just sort of, <laughs> Swimming along, jittery, no real direction, no real smooth flow. Um, psilocybin, again, sort of a different, for, for all of these being hallucinogenic drugs, affecting sort of some of the same receptors, but then some not, they're pretty distinct differences. Um, and then Ibogaine, uh, this is a drug that affects the glutamate receptors, serotonergic receptors, dopamine receptors. It's a pretty wild psychedelic. Um, it effectively reversed the whole pattern compared to the wild type control. So these fish then went to the top and then eventually over time went to the bottom. Um, that, was, that was pretty interesting. So after giving these fish all of these drugs, looking at them in these reconstructions, uh, essentially it was like, if you show me a trace, I'll tell you what drug that fish was on. Um, and if I can do that, the computer could probably do that. So we spent a lot of time developing um, movement uh, uh, pattern analysis. Um, if you remember, the LSD sort of has this top dwelling phenotype. It spent a lot of time at the top. Nicotine did the same thing. Uh, 
so can you really accurately distinguish between nicotine and LSD just by looking at this temporal reconstruction? Uh, by adding another camera, we were able to do a, a full 3D reconstruction. So what I'm about to show you now is X, Y, and Z. There's no time characteristic except for the path. Um, and, and you'll see by having that, the second camera on the top, distinct differences between the LSD and the nicotine, something that wasn't evident um, in the temporal reconstructions. So nicotine has this very stereotypic sort of figure eight pattern that just happens over and over and over. LSD doesn't have that sort of stereotyped behavior. Uh, it's, it's more of just a jumbled mess. So there we go. Now we have a way to distinguish between nicotine and LSD when at first we didn't necessarily think that uh, we could do that accurately. Um, so we did uh, movement pattern analysis. This is essentially, we're, we're skipping all of this stuff. We're, we, I showed you the visual uh, tracks. Using a number of statistical techniques from uh, geology that are used to like map and predict projections of hurricanes or bird migrations, we were able to analyze the track, um, classify the drugs based on what neurotransmitter systems they hit, and then gave the machine learning process or the program a drug that was unlabeled or we didn't know what target that drug was. And then it would return to us with 94 to 91% accuracy what neurotransmitter system that drug was affecting. Um, the application of this is in sort of high throughput pharm um, pharmacological research, so drug development. Um, you can give a bunch of drugs fish, record them in an automated system, and know which compounds are worth investigating more in something like mammals, uh, mice, and so on. So that's what I did uh, during my graduate work. So I wanted to sort of go, go back to this. Um, this is our death or addiction game. Uh, so we have LSD and psilocybin here. Essentially, uh, this whole part would be the safest, quote unquote, drugs to take. Um, up here, heroin, morphine, nicotine, diazepam, alcohol, that would be the most dangerous in that if you take too much, um, you could potentially die and you could become addicted. Below that, we have the scheduling of the Controlled Substance Act in the United States. Schedule one uh, means no medical use accepted in the United States large uh, addiction or abuse potential or addiction potential, and that there's no safe way to consume the drug even in a medical situation, so in a doctor's office. We have cannabis uh, as a dangerous drug. Not really, not at all. Um, LSD, psilocybin, DMT, all of these psychedelic drugs that uh, are objectively or sort of scientifically safe uh, in Schedule 1, prevented from research, prevented from consumption, um, a whole number of things, sending a lot of people to jail, ruining a lot of lives. Um, move over to not even controlled at all, we got ta tobacco, alcohol, caffeine, mostly all up there, dangerous drugs. So. I think that everybody here probably knew this beforehand, but the Controlled Substance Act and the scheduling that they have really doesn't make objective sense or science, scientific sense. Um, it's pretty much based on subjective bias and prejudice, and it's unfortunate for a number of reasons. Um, to me, most to me personally, I think it's a shame that we can't research these drugs more. Because as we just talked about, cannabis is important for maintaining health and, and having a, a properly functioning endocannabinoid system is important for a healthy lifestyle. And then as I've mentioned with LSD, you take uh, such a tiny little amount of this drug and it completely alters your sort of consciousness or um, how your cognitive mindset, how you're approaching the world for 12 hours. Um, if we want to understand consciousness, 
then that's a tool that we should be using to do that. Um, I was at a talk by one of the leading uh, LSD researchers in the country, David Nichols, and he was emphatically making the point that there's typically three things that people say that change their life completely. Getting married, having a kid, and doing LSD for the first time. And we can't even fit, we can't, we're not allowed to research it. Um, and I take that back because uh, I did research LSD. Uh, in fact, it was much easier to get LSD and five grams of MDMA for free from the government than it was to get anything uh, related to cannabis or cannabinoids. The only um, way that we could receive cannabinoid compounds was if they were mixed in with alcohol. So it was just sort of teeing up the narrative of getting faded is bad. You can't mix these drugs. You don't want to do that. It's uh, the, the drug abuse narrative that uh, NIDA sort of facil has been facilitating for a long time. So, you know, there is movement. Things are getting better, uh, but there's also upsets. Uh, attitudes towards medical and adult use cannabis are rapidly changing. This was a, a headline from the other day. Even Fox News internal poll shows a majority of Americans now support marijuana legalization. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting times to be involved in that space right now. Things change daily. Um, also, LSD researchers are using crowdfunding to finally get the first images of a human brain on acid. I mean, this to me is crazy that we haven't done this yet. We haven't given a human LSD and put them into an fMRI machine to see what happens. Um, yeah. I was going to mention too. Um, what, I mean, what, do you do you recall like the sort of the timeline for when some of these some of this research kind of started, and then like the gap of time we sort of you know we had in without? Because I mean, I, I I know it's been sort of at least you know I, I would think at least you know 20, 30 years since when it was yeah, initially. Yeah, that. There are studies of people giving beta fish LSD um, in the 60s, mm -hmm. um, cats LSD, elephants LSD. Um, US government. The, yeah, the CIA. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like, uh, is it Pineapple Express where they're like, shut it down? You know, it just, <laughs> the, and I think it was uh, Ken Kesey that said, you know, they sort of did it, they were doing experiments in Stanford. They sort of, Know, sent these kids into a room, uh, gave them LSD, and they came out bright-eyed and smiling and you know, sort of had this new mindset, and they said, you better lock that room up. We don't even want to go back into that room. Um, it's, it's just unfortunate. So I'm, I'm super stoked that they're finally doing this. They're, they're crowdfunding it. They say, you know what? We want to do this. It's, it's, we're motivated. We're curious. We don't need your funding. There's people that want to fund this research. And it's in Europe, of course, not in the United States. Um, but at least it's being done. Um, this headline is from uh, the Mueller case. Uh, Kim Mueller in Sacramento, a federal judge, had the opportunity and actually showed a lot of faith by allowing arguments even to be made in court about whether or not cannabis should be scheduled, uh, classified in Schedule One. She at least heard them out. Um, I don't understand how if you hear the argument out, you could realistically think that it should be in Schedule 1. I just cannot comprehend how that's even possible. Um, so it was pretty disappointing when she uh, did not rule in the favor of, of removing that. That could have been something could have been something great. So we'll have to wait again. It's not the first time that it's happened, but I'm hoping that with public opinion shifting uh, that the government will finally get its uh, act together. This was pretty funny too. This happened a few days ago. Um, Dare Dare's website picked up a news article on like essentially what is like an onion, a satirical news site. Um, took some of their stats and then wrote this, this article about it that included something that said, for every one joint of marijuana, four teenagers become burdened with pregnancy. Um, this, was, this was like a few days ago. I mean, who wrote that? Um, and, it, and you know, and I'm sure you guys all know, it gets even worse if you go back and look at um, when marijuana was first prohibited and white women are going to the jazz clubs. I mean, it's just racist. It's prejudiced. It, there's no scientific rationale before it, for it at all. But, you know, 
It's, it's these crazy uh, claims still exist today. Um, I don't know. Did you guys have dare when you were growing up? Did anybody take mm -hmm. dare? Yeah. Yeah. I did too. And you know, I learned about drugs and dare that I don't even really think exist that they told me about. It's just sort of it's crazy. Um, so, like I was sort of hinting to, what are we missing out on by this sort of schedule? What are we missing out on, and and, and why is it important that we're missing out on this? Um, there was someone who posted on the Facebook comment about understanding how these drugs interact with brain evolution. So I wanted to sort of throw this in there. There's three primary cortices in the brain. The primary sensory cor uh, cortical area, the secondary, and the tertiary. Um, I'm going to use the uh, uh, visual cortex as an example. So this is a, a rat brain. The eyes are here. The neuron from the eye goes directly into this red area. This is where like very primary features are, are discerned. So sort of straight lines, white versus black, you know, very rudimentary uh, visual cues. From there, uh, okay, so you can see how much of the rat brain is devoted to that area, even in the cat. Then you go to the human. This is our primary visual cortex, meaning that from our eyes, this is how much of our brain surface area is devoted to that initial processing. From there, the signals from the eyes sort of hit the back of the brain and then just get splashed throughout the brain. Uh, this is in the secondary and then tertiary areas of the brain. Um, this is where things get really crazy, and we honestly have no idea what is going on, how it relates to consciousness, um, and sort of the phenomenology of being who you are. In the, in the cortex, so the bark of the brain is a very thin layer of uh, gray matter. As you move up to humans, the organization of that thin layer gets increasingly more and more and more complex. Um, so essentially input signals come from here, get shot up to this one, go to the next one, come back down, go back this way. Um, this is where the magic is. This is where consciousness is. And without having the drugs to study how that changes and actually do it effectively with uh, brain imaging and brain studies, I don't think we're ever going to actually understand consciousness or uh, what it's like to be human or what it's like to be you or me and what makes us different. I think the, I know the answer is in there, um, but without the right tools to be able to probe at it, we're not going to be able to understand it. This is one of the biggest uh, challenges in neuroscience. Cool. So uh, I just want to open up for any questions. Uh, of course, if you want to you know, remain involved in these discussions, I'd encourage you to get involved with SSDP. Uh, Sacramento Normal also meets in Sacramento every month. Uh, we welcome anybody to come and attend there. Um, Earwood, for how kind of crazy the web design is, they actually have a lot of good information there um, and subjective user reports as well. Uh, and then MAPS is a uh, psychedelic research association that promotes psychedelic drug research. Um, as well as, this is a great book, Can't Find My Way Home, America in the Great Stone Age, 1945 to 2000. From that book, VH1 made a documentary called The Drug Years. I highly recommend that you guys check out The Drug Years if you haven't. I think you can get it on YouTube. And then Dirty Pictures is a documentary about uh, Alexander Shulgren. This is the uh, chemist who synthesized MDMA and all of the other phenylalanines um, in his basement. Um, this sort of chronicles his uh, adventures in life. So those are cool things to check out if you guys wanted to learn more about some of this stuff. I'm curious, you had uh, DMT and as one of the ones with the uh, low therapeutic index. Um, I'm curious what like the toxicity effects are. Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I just did a calculation because there was quite a lot of interest in DMT, so I just found the numbers and did the calculation and then put it on there. That's kind of a follow-up question to that. Isn't it true that um, our brains produce when you amounts of DMT and DMT? Right, and so there's that, the idea that DMT is released when we're born and when we die. Um, I also believe those things, but as I was reading about sort of these things last night, it seemed like in the more recent literature they were setting those things up and then saying these are sort of myths and it, we're going back from that. Um, I don't think we know, and honestly, with the scheduling of the drugs, DMT Schedule 1, we can't really find out. Um, so hopefully that changes. Yep? What makes LSD different from the safest 
Um, yeah, and so I, I was trying to be careful with safe because I'm not trying to like, you know, well, the doctor told me that it was safe. I'm out of here. You know, <laughs> see you later. Not saying that at all. What makes it, why it's so low on the scale is because the effective dose that you have to take to feel the effects is so low and that the dose that you would have to take to kill yourself doesn't exist. Um, and that you're not going to get addicted to it because you, you can't really repeatedly do it over and over and over again. You know, the, the effects diminish with repeated use and, um, you know, the mo probably, so from a physical perspective, LSD and hallucinogenics are very safe, but from a psychological perspective, it's sort of Pandora's box. You have to have the right set and the right setting. Um, you can certainly find them in the literature. I think it's a vestigial trait of the National Institute of Drug Abuse funding all of the research on it. Um, you know, MDMA is being investigated for clinical trials for PTSD, uh, merit uh, therapy. Um, there's potential therapeutic benefits uh, from LSD and the psychedelics and hallucinogenics. Um, there, I think, you know, a dare myth would be if you take it two or three times, you're going to get it stuck in your spinal cord and you're going to have this crazy flashback and you could go completely insane. Um, has it happened to people? Maybe. Did they think themselves into it? Maybe. Did they, put, you know, sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, perhaps? Um, but I think there's a lot of people that are just fine. Yeah, 2CE, 2CI, all of those. The problem with those designer drugs is they're churned out so quickly that it's really difficult for science to sort of keep up with that. Um, they're also sort of churned out in a clandestine lab where there's not really good controls and uh, you know, sort of it's a dangerous situation. So, I had a question actually. You're talking about uh, lethal doses. Um, I'm trying to remember what the. Do you recall what the lethal dose is for? For cannabis, too? I I know it's it's a lot. I just don't remember. I can't put my uh, number on it. Um, no, I don't think there is a lethal dose. For okay. Cannabis. Why? Yeah, I think I think they were saying something about like it was at least fifteen hundred pounds within a certain amount yeah. of time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lethal dose of water too. It's right. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's that's what I was thinking. They were they were equating it to like drowning essentially, where yeah. you have to intake, um, you know, ten times your body weight within an hour or something or half an hour. Yeah, like yeah. Um, one of the LSD studies, you guys should look this up, honestly. The LSD, do LSD elephants, Google it. Um, they injected so much LSD into this elephant that they claimed that the LSD killed it. But um, when they went back and tried to replicate it, they couldn't replicate it. So there might have been something pre existing in the elephant that went wrong. Um, but it's a hilarious reading. These researchers describe what the elephant was doing prior to it dying. Um, also, because cannabis is right here, it's the same as the LSD and psilocybin in that there is no lethal dose. None that you could actually physically consume. Right. Within a, right. Yeah. Right. It, it would be so much smoke that like you would you wouldn't be getting oxygen at that point. Right. So you're not exactly. dying from cannabis. Yeah. You're dying from lack of oxygen. Mm -hmm. I noticed that caffeine is kind of in the middle of the graph, but when you're talking about the zebrafish, you were saying how bad caffeine. So I was wondering just why, it, what the disconnect there is for me, that I'm seeing caffeine in the middle here, but then was interpreting what you said earlier as caffeine is the worst drug. Uh, just, in, just in my experience, it's sort of what I've observed, right? Um, it's in the middle because if you have it at the effective dose and don't go any further, you should be all right. If you're just modulating the adenosine receptors, as soon as you start getting into shutting off GABA and internal cellular functions, that's when things start shutting down. And that's a, and that's a log, essentially kind of a log scale yeah. too, so yeah. looking at it that way. Also, by the way, this is, I, I sort of was, was beating myself up by having this graph in here. There was a the, the study in Nature that described margin of exposure calculations. I'd really suggest you guys take a look if you're interested at that paper too. It's available for free. It's an open access paper. Um, they devised a new method to 
calculate this, the placement of the drugs here. And what they discovered was that um, even putting cannabis in the same scale or category as the other drugs just doesn't make sense because it's an order of magnitude, like 10,000 times more safer than all of the other drugs. It can't even be considered on the same scale. And they really, they spent a good page describing how um, when the government or government groups get together to describe how dangerous drugs are, they can't really get to a decision. The science isn't there. They, they're pressured to, to make a decision, so they just throw their hands in the air and say, okay, one to 10. Everybody just tell us what drug, where you think the drugs are. Then we'll compare notes, we'll come to consensus, and that's what we'll report back. You can't do that because the drugs are so dramatically different. Um, and this margin of exposure paper really uh, illustrates that nicely. Any uh, last minute questions? Okay. Uh, you mentioned that intake of um, cannabinoids can be uh, good for the immune system because it binds to the C2 receptors, right? But uh, how much would be too much? Like, would, it, would somebody who frequently, chronically like, intakes cannabinoids every day, would he be compromising his immune system by possibly making his body downregulate the number of cannabinoids that produces by itself? I haven't come across anything that would describe a downregulation or like a reduction of receptor subtypes because of constant, like a tolerance situation. So when you develop tolerance to opiates, your neurons literally are like, there's way too much opiates in here. We're pulling the receptors back into the cell. Therefore, you need more drug to get the same high. I haven't, I haven't come across anything like that with uh, cannabinoids. Surely it may be plausible, but until we have uh, unfettered access to the compounds to do research, uh, I don't know. And I think, too, with all drugs, it's sort of an Aristotelian virtue ethics thing, right? Um, anything in excess is bad. Anything, you know, that you constantly do, you should find a happy medium and, and do it that way. Virtue ethics. Yeah. Um, so, all this considered, where's your research taking you next? Um, well, so, what, I, what I'm working on now is integration of data. Neuroscience in and of itself is a pretty diverse discipline. So we have people studying genetic SNPs or polymorphisms in, let's say, a serotonin transporter and trying to relate that to sort of dispositions to anxiety or depression. There's also people, and I'm in this camp of social neuroscience, that are looking at um, extraneous factors around people and how that affects their brain processing. So from culture, language, and social structures to genetic expression, that's the, the gamut that neuroscience covers. Unfortunately, as with most scientific disciplines, the people that do genetics talk to the people that do the genetics, and the people that do the social stuff talk to them. There's no sort of cross-pollination there. And so I'm trying to work on data systems that integrate the data in a way that more accurately reflects neuroscience. Well, uh, let's give a round of applause for our <laughs> And that's, uh, that's actually all we had prepared for you today at our meeting. Uh, once again, uh, thank you so much for spending your, uh, a little bit of your afternoon, your early evening with us today. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Students with Potential Drug Policy and some of the stuff that we're doing on campus, including some of our policy work, our activism, our events, and special things that are going on, we have our sign-up sheet right outside the door there on a chair. If you missed it earlier, uh, please feel free to sign up. And we're not very, we're not intrusive at all in the emails. Maybe one a week at most. So <laughs> we try to keep that uh, keep that low, uh, just for everybody's consideration. But thanks again for everybody for showing up, and uh, hope you all have a great rest of the night. It's still going. Can you log in? So I can. Still going. Hey, sorry, I was late. I passed off. I don't know. No, it's alright. Hi. Oh, it's been a while. You were on this crazy uh, trip of the coast through yeah, the forest. Yeah, I saw. <laughs>